This is the Virginia Decides 4th Congressional District Forum, brought to you in partnership with Chamber RVA and VPM News. Presented by Altria. Sponsored by Capital One, Dominion Energy Center, and Herschler. This evening's moderator is Craig Carper from VPM News. Tonight's candidates for the 4th Congressional District are Donald McEachin and Leon Benjamin. Good evening and welcome to Virginia Decides, a 4th Congressional District Forum brought to you by VPM News and Chamber RVA. I'm VPM News Director Craig Carper, your moderator for this evening. Our candidates tonight are incumbent Democratic Congressman Don McEachin and his Republican challenger Leon Benjamin. A brief word about our format this evening. First, each candidate will be allowed to provide a two-minute opening statement. The same questions will be asked of each candidate. Both candidates will be allowed 90 seconds to provide a response to each question. I'll pose questions in alternating order so that no one candidate always responds first or last. Approximately half of our questions came to us tonight from VPM Citizens Agenda, which sought input from our audience on issues important to them. The others were written by me. Questions were not given to the candidates ahead of time. I may ask a series of questions in a lightning round, which will require yes or no answers with no more than one sentence of explanation. Each candidate will be allowed to provide a two minute closing statement. And now I'd like to welcome our two candidates for the fourth congressional district, Democratic Congressman Don McEachin. Welcome, Congressman. Thank you. And his Republican challenger, Bishop Leon Benjamin. Welcome Thank to you, sir. Thank you so much. God bless you. Our first two-minute opening statement by virtue of a coin toss goes to Congressman McEachin. Good evening. I want to begin by thanking RVA and VPM for hosting this debate and for uh, Bishop Benjamin for running for this office. You know, competition is what it's all about. Uh, the exchange of ideas is so, is so important in today's age to be able to have a vigorous and sound yet uh, friendly debate on the issues of the day. And I want to thank all of you all for tuning in. Uh, a uh, informed electorate is the best electorate, and it means a lot to all of us that you've taken the time to watch these proceedings. You know, today we find ourselves in the midst of the worst pandemic in our memory. We have 212,000 of our fellow Americans are dead. Millions have been affected uh, with job loss. Businesses are shuttered. Uh, the economy is struggling, and lives, quite frankly, have been shattered. Parents oftentimes don't know whether school is safe and too many Americans worry about putting food on the table, paying rent and paying the bills. To resolve this, we have to bring back a strong and functioning country. And to do that, we have to address public health. The economy cannot recover if parents and families are too concerned with whether or not going outside is going to expose them to a lethal infection. We need a vaccine, but a vaccine that folks can have faith in not one touted, touted by a desperate president trying to win votes instead of saving lives. This year in Congress, I've been dedicated to finding solutions to help people. We've passed relief acts, providing loans for small businesses to protect jobs, money for testing and tracing to get this pandemic under control, and stimulus checks to help families in need. Yet still more needs to be done. And we've, we've tried to uh, get an intransient Senate to work with us on the HEROES Act. I look forward to having a, more of a conversation about this and many more topics tonight. Again, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Congressman. Our next opening statement goes to Bishop Benjamin. Good evening, uh, all of our wonderful, wonderful people in the 4th Congressional District. Thank you, VPM and RVA Chamber. And this, uh, again, God bless you, Congressman McEachin. Thank you for the opportunity to debate. I think this is very crucial that we are all tuning in and those that are listening to understand how important it is for us to have new leadership now for Stronger Virginia. I'm a husband of 29 years, a pastor of 18 years, a Navy combat veteran serving in the Gulf Wars in Desert Shield, Desert Storm on board the John F. Kennedy. I'm a child of God. I gave my life to the Lord even in Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah. And I understand the discipline uh, being in the military, knowing that not only should we take commands, but knowing how to also find solutions. It's not enough just to listen. You got to also be active. 
I'm running because I believe that my opponent has not been as active as he should be. He has been missing. He has been missing in action. And I believe that now Virginia, with the weariness of COVID-19, those locked in, shut down, those who have lost jobs, businesses destroyed because of rioting and looting and the unrest, the law and order needs to be restored. We need safe schools, but we have to restore and back our police. We have to stand with those in our community who have lived there for years, but now they're looking at moving and going somewhere safe. I believe tonight we will get a clear indication, a clear indication of who should be the next congressman in the 4th Congressional District. I appreciate your time tonight and your vote on November 3rd. Thank you, Bishop Benjamin. Our first question goes to Congressman McEachin. Congressman, what have you learned from the COVID pandemic and how has that affected your positions on health care and the economy? Well, you know, the pandemic has really ripped bare the inequities and inequalities in our, in our system, not only our health care system, but uh, society in America across the board. And one of the things that we've uh, tried desperately to do is to talk about the reasons why there's such a disparate impact in, in the effect of COVID-19 on different types of communities, whether it's brown communities, tribal communities, black communities, or the poor. And what we've seen is, is that is in large parts because of the environment in which they live. Uh, oftentimes folks are exposed to bad water, bad air, and then when you add something like COVID-19 to the mix, you end up with a disaster. That's why you see uh, such disparate uh, impacts on these types of communities. I've had the privilege of introducing the Environmental Justice for All Act, which is an act that's uh, meant to empower these communities. It doesn't do what Washington typically does, which is tell folks what to do. Rather, it empowers them to uh, take the, find their own answers, whether it's going to court, whether it's taking investment monies to, to do that, uh, whether it's uh, engaging with the federal government in dialogue about what happens uh, from an environmental standpoint before the federal government takes certain, certain actions. So um, to me, the one thing that COVID-19 has done is it's, it's emphasized the inequity in our, in our system. We already knew that it existed, uh, but now we see some solutions that I and others are putting forward in terms of environmental justice and other civil rights types of actions. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Bishop Benjamin, same question. Uh, what has COVID-19, or how has COVID-19 affected your positions on healthcare and the economy? I believe the greatest, the greatest thing is understanding more and more about the virus. We had little understanding, of course, in the beginning. But as we began to understand what we were actually facing with this coronavirus, we found out that there were certain groups that were more susceptible than others. Uh, our aging group, 60 and up, more susceptible to the virus. Then to find out that having one to two uh, morbidities, uh, underlying conditions like diabetes and, and uh, other uh, asthma, lung issues, uh, we found out that they were very vulnerable. And then we found out that our children were less vulnerable because the, the disease didn't spread through our children. But then the decision started to happen as far as lockdowns. We saw businesses locked down. We saw churches locked down. When we saw the suicide rate go up and we saw the murder and violence go up because of lockdowns, I think we might have done something maybe a little bit differently. Um, and we definitely needed our churches open uh, with those who are now facing uh, suicide and depression. Um, this is something that I believe, as far as a health condition, the cure uh, sometimes looked like it was more worse than the actual virus itself. I think with solutions now, with vaccines and uh, prophylactics and therapeutics, we can fight this now head on, especially after our president just came out of COVID successfully. Thank you, Bishop Benjamin. And again, we're alternating order on questions, so I will ask you the next question. Uh, will you take an FDA-approved FDA coronavirus vaccine when it is released? And should kid, uh, students and teachers be required to take it when they go back to school? And this question is for me. It is for you, sir. Okay, great. I, I, I believe that I, I'm 
been here all my life when when they had the chicken pops and and the measles vaccines created i've been in the military we had to take uh, certain vaccines to cross over into going into foreign territory. I believe vaccines uh, play their part in strengthening uh, the overall community. And if the FDA comes out with a vaccine as tested and proven, uh, and it can help those who feel they need to have the vaccine, then by all means, we should take the vaccine. I believe that uh, still uh, there are people who have developed uh, immunity and, and we don't hear a lot about that, of course, uh, that those who had it and didn't even know they had it and have now developed the strong T cells uh, to fight it off. Um, it's, it's an amazing time, I think, where we want to, to protect those most vulnerable, our children. And so I'm for vaccines. And, and on the question of students and students. teachers? If students are able to take that, of course, we don't want to bypass the parents, the families. We'll, if they, they make that decision uh, to take the vac vaccine, then I think they should take it after they make that decision. But you think it should be a decision and not a requirement, is that it correct? It should be a decision. I mean, I'm not for mandates. I think we start infringing upon rights and, uh, and our human rights and our civil rights, and, and I believe that it should not be mandated, no. All right, thank you. Congressman McEachin, would you take a FDA approved coronavirus vaccine when it is released and should students and teachers be required to take it? Well, thank you for the question. And of course, um, Bishop Benjamin talks about how we've learned about things over time. Well, one of the reasons it took us a while to learn about this virus is because the president of the United States, the person who he embraces, decided that he would lie to the American public and that he wouldn't tell us how bad it was. He would tell a writer how bad it was, but he wouldn't tell the rest of us how bad it was. And so that's one of the reasons why so many people relied on the president. The president's gonna lead us out of this, and the, what is, the president's done is led us into a mess with 212,000 of our fellow citizens dead. I would absolutely take the vaccine. If it's been FDA approved, if it's been through all the rigorous standards that the FDA puts forward, I would absolutely take it. And I would urge children and teachers to take it as well, unless there's a religious exception. I absolutely think it should be mandated because when you're in the public square like that, when you're with other people's children, when you're teaching other people's children, you need to take all the safety precautions that you that you are that that are technologically feasible. And again, unless there's a religious exception for that, uh, I think that it needs to be taken. Thank you, Congressman. We're going to stick with you for this next question. The Senate is likely to confirm Amy Coney Barrett to the U.S. Senate, uh, U.S. Supreme Court. The House will not have a role in that decision. If a new six to three conservative court were to overturn the Affordable Care Act, with what kind of comprehensive health care plan would you replace it with? You can't really answer that question. Let me tell you why. Because you have to uh, take the time, I know this as a lawyer, to read the decision that the court comes down with. If the court strikes down the ACA or Obamacare, as it's also known, uh, we have to understand the reasons why they struck it down. Um, but, you know, I've spoken to my colleague, Bobby Scott, who is the chair of the, the committee that would uh, handle uh, the repair of the ACA in that case. And we're absolutely convinced that anything the court would strike down, we can fix as long as we have the political will to do so. And that, of course, means a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic president. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Bishop Benjamin, same question. If the Affordable Care Act were to be struck down, what kind of comprehensive health care plan would you replace it with? I, I think the most important thing with the 4th Congressional District, uh, along with the health care, is the safety of our community. I, I think what's going on right now, and that's why people are panicking, people are afraid to come out outside after dark. Our, I've never seen the city of Richmond in, in such uproar. Um, businesses uh, destroyed, boarded up, our very own police boarded up. Uh, this, this has never been in all the years I've lived here. And we can, we can talk about health care, but we have people right now who, who don't even want or have the, the confidence in our police. And that's why we have to stand with them. Our safety is so important right now. And then our education and then our health, our health care. This is something right now where the 4th Congressional District needs attention. And, and my opponent just has not been paying attention. He hasn't been paying attention, so he doesn't really have the insight 
of what's really going on. If, 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 if he would have called out the, the National Guard like he did to say, take away the guns, he should have called the National Guard to bring law and order uh, back into the community. Um, but, but instead, he, he's playing politics with people's lives. And we cannot play politics right now with people's lives. People are depending on us to lead them and give them the right directions that they need. And I think the 4th Congressional District right now needs new leadership and to bring that law and order. Bishop Benjamin, you spoke about uh, police and the economy. We're going to start with the economy and we will get to police. Uh, individuals, families and businesses have all felt squeezed by the pandemic. Some in the workforce have lost their jobs and some businesses have, ha have had to close. What do you want to see in the next relief package passed by Congress? And how can Congress most responsibly provide aid in the next year if additional interventions are needed? I think with the first CARES Act, it was on time. I think the, the president, the administration, the Congress, everyone came together knowing that the people, they took a risk. They said, let us slow it down so that we can save lives and many lives were slowed down, uh, were saved because of the shutdown. But the shutdown was not supposed to be for so long. We see the devastation now. Many businesses probably may not recover. We need another CARES Act, a CARES Act too. I think when we talk about our small businesses being able uh, to make sure that they keep food on the table, not only for themselves, but for their employees, and then being able to now with kids at home learning virtually, we have parents now who've had to change up their whole routine, wondering when the kids can go back to school. Uh, many, many other systems right now, kids are going back to school. I think the fourth congressional district needs to take a second look about how we reopen our small businesses, how we reopen our schools. And in that stimulus package, I believe we should, we should get that aid to our families, to our parents, to our small businesses, and, and to other agencies that can help us get reopened. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Congressman McEachin, you've cast votes on this. Uh, what do you think belongs in the next relief package passed by Congress, and what may be needed next year? Craig, I'm not going to duck your question. I'm going to get to it in just a second. But I want my constituents of the 4th Congressional District to realize that that man doesn't have a health care plan. You heard the question. He didn't answer it. He's just like his president. He doesn't have a plan for you That's and health care. Now, he talks about law and order and you the police and all this to, sort to of thing. Mr. B Bishop, I didn't interrupt you when you were lying about me. I'd appreciate it if you're quiet right now. He wants to talk about law and order. Well, folks, if I were in favor of law and order, my wife would put me out. She is the Commonwealth Attorney for the City of Richmond. But you know what? I understand that people are in the streets because they want to trust the police. They want to make sure that they, their encounters with the police are safe. And that's why I am a co-sponsor of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which would ban no-knock warrants, which would ban chokeholds. But we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Let me get to the question that he doesn't have an answer for, which is what should be in this package. We need to do things for states and, lo and localities, not just for the sake of giving uh, Governor Northam money for the, giving them money, but so that he doesn't have to lay off folks, so that our localities don't have to lay off folks, our first responders and the like, because that just deepens the recession. We need to make sure we come up with another round of money for our small businesses. We need to do things for the airlines. We don't need a, another CARES Act. We passed the HEROES Act. It's been done, folks. It's the Senate and the Republicans like Bishop Benjamin who are sitting on their hands and playing games and not passing the bill. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, in, sticking with the economy and uh, wealth, uh, the bottom 50% of U.S. families owned just 1% of total U.S. wealth in 2016, according to research from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Some experts expect the pandemic to deepen inequalities. What, if anything, should Congress do to change this? There's, there's a number of things that we need to do to change this, but one of the things that we're going to have to do to restart this economy, because you're not just going to be able to wave a wand to do it, is to come up with an infrastructure plan, and we've done that in Congress. It's an infrastructure plan that calls for massive federal investment, rebuilding our roads, rebuilding our bridges, uh, redoing our grid, and it's a green infrastructure plan, putting in charging stations so we can convert to electrical vehicles. Things of that sort is going to be what's required to uh, get our economy going again. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, 
Bishop Benjamin, same question. Uh, what can Congress, or, or, I'm sorry, what, if anything, should Congress do to change income inequality in this country? Well, uh, again, and something, something that Congressman McKeachin said, I, and I have to address it um, as far as a plan for, for health care. He's, he's been in there for four years, and they still don't have a plan. He had a chance, but he spent more time trying to follow uh, Russian uh, collusion hoaxes and uh, standing with the Green New Deal, which is going to raise our taxes, which is going to take away our fossil fuels, take away all of our energy, and we're going to go back into the dark ages. So they don't have a plan. And that's, that's why right now what needs to be included right now is, again, standing with our community. The 4th Congressional District right now is die in dire need of leadership to get law and order. He had a chance to send the National Guard and to back up the police, but he didn't. He had a chance to be able uh, to get with Nancy Pelosi by now and say, send the money. He's standing everything against what we really need. And so right now, we need not just infrastructure, we need to get our small businesses confidence again that they can reopen and that they can start business again as normal and deal with the situation with COVID-19, understanding that we know more about this virus now than we did before. And we need to understand this is the greatest time for opportunity zones that my opponent, McEachin, has not even mentioned. It's the greatest program that ever came out, being able to help businesses save up to 15% in capital gains taxes and be able to raise the tide again in our poorest communities. Thank you, Bishop. Sticking with the budget, should we be concerned about the federal deficit? And what is your plan to, if so, what is your plan to reduce it? I tell you, that's a good question. You know, we keep spending and spending and spending. We know what's going to happen. It's going to bust. We're going to balloon. And we need to understand that we have to control the spending. Right now, we are in a position where we have to save our businesses now. We have to. Now, some of the monies, it's amazing uh, that my opponent, McKeachin, was trying to fund the arts and things that had nothing to do, unions, that had nothing to do with recovery. Um, he was standing with that, but not standing with the fact that our small businesses needed monies to keep their employees uh, uh, with food on the table and to be able to pay their bills. And, and so we need a true stimulus, but at the same time, we have to know that we cannot leave a big fat bill for the next generation. We have to control the spending. We have to come to the point where our economy is back up and running and people are working again and we can begin to control our spending. This is very important. No one wants to keep spending money like this. We know what's going to happen if we keep spending like this. It's going to balloon. It's going to bust. And that's going to leave another situation that we don't want to deal with on, in the days ahead. So we need to be able to, again, get our businesses back up and going, help our families understand that we want them to get back to work, and then get our schools back open again, get our kids back in school again, and then be able to understand that now let's, let's go ahead now, let's control the spending because now we have the economy working again. Thank you, Bishop. Congressman, same question. How concerned should the U.S. be about the deficit and what can Congress do to reduce it? Thank you for the question, question Craig. And you know, I thought that uh, Bishop Benjamin was gonna be a different type of Republican and that he wouldn't be one of those who just makes stuff up but you just heard him again. He's just making stuff up. I'm not he, talks about, up. he talks I'm not about opportunity up. zones. We were doing enterprise zones before that was cool. You know, I've got a record on enterprise zones as a state legislator. He talks about I didn't stand with the businesses when, in helping them with their payroll. That's what the CARES Act was about, folks. Payroll Protection Plan. You've heard it. PPP. We passed that. We're trying to pass it again, but for the fact that the Republicans in the Senate won't go along with the plan and the Republicans in the House tried all they could to resist it. We just had the numbers to pass it. Still haven't heard that health care plan. He's casting aspersions on what I've been doing while I've been in the House of Representatives. I've been trying to protect the ACA. I've been trying to protect your Obamacare. And I'm for uh, a public option to allow folks to buy in to Medicare should they choose to. Folks, it's it's about time for his 15 minutes to be up. 
This is, this is a serious time that calls for serious solutions. I'm your congressman. It's been a pleasure to be doing this all this time. I'm going to continue to do it if you reelect me. St as he gives, your, gives answers, listen for solutions, because right now all you're hearing is typical Republican Party line of blah de blah blah de blah Thank you, Congressman. Uh, sticking with you, what changes should we make to voting in this country, or the process of voting in this country, if any? We need to make voting easier. And Craig, let me uh, beg your indulgence for just a second. I didn't answer your question about the deficit, which is in large part, we need to reverse the Trump uh, tax cuts uh, that gave huge amounts of money to the richest folks in America and very little relief to middle class America and very little relief to the working poor. In addition to that, we need to end the fossil fuel subsidies. You bring back trillions and billions of dollars that way, you can begin to put a dent in the deficit. Uh, now, the, the pending question is? Voting. What voting. changes we need to, to voting? We need to make voting easier. In my judgment, we ought to make, the minute you turn 18, you should be a registered voter. Uh, we need to make, uh, if, uh, if something happens, you ought to be able to vote as early as possible. I'm so proud of what the Virginia General Assembly did in this past session, taking a state that had been regressive when it came to voting and making it easier to vote. I think, uh, I think we should follow Virginia's example of making Election Day a holiday and so that people don't have to worry about, can I get time off from work if they wait that long to vote? So early voting, absentee voting with no excuses, and election day holiday uh, would be among the things that I would suggest. And Thank we you. did that by the, a lot of that, by the way, in House Bill 1 uh, this year in the House Representatives, HR 1, excuse me. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Bishop Benjamin, same question. What changes, if any, should we make to the voting process in the United States? Well, we, we've seen it and, and we've heard it, and it's true, even here in our own district, breaking into mailboxes and stealing mail, uh, that should never happen. And especially right now in the most crucial election, uh, mail-in balloting, we've had people who have received more than one mail-in ballots. Uh, that should not be happening. Uh, we, we have right now people who can do absentee balloting without a second signature. Uh, that means that someone can just take the ballot and turn it in and not knowing if the person actually wanted to vote. Uh, th there's some things that the Virginia General Assembly has done that uh, under Republican General Assembly, it would have never been voted into. It has uh, diminished the integrity of, of our voting system. I think what we have right now is that what we need right now is to make sure that people get out to vote, yes, in person. And people need to, again, if you can't be there, then do the absentee uh, 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 mailing. We should encourage, I, I remember when I took my son to do his first uh, voting at 18, uh, I was a very proud father to see my children um, go out and, and vote. And we do need to encourage our, our, our young people uh, to, to be a part of the process. Uh, so, so many think that they say my voice uh, won't be heard, but that's not true. Your voice is your vote. And I want to encourage everyone to get out to vote. Don't think for one, uh, one instant that your vote will not count. Make it count in this election. I'm going to break format just a, a moment because you mentioned mail-in voting. Uh, Congressman McEachin, should Virginians feel safe voting by mail? Why or why not? Just a couple sentences here and then I'll let you respond, Bishop. You know, Congresswoman Spanberger and I went to the uh, Sandston Station, which is the big station that handles a lot of the mail in this area and up and down the 4th Congressional District as well as parts of her district. Uh, they're perfectly capable of handling uh, voting by mail. Um, they were running about 800,000 pieces a day at that time. They can get up to a couple of million pieces a day. So they can certainly handle the volume. So they should feel safe. Um, I voted early. I'm encouraging people to vote early. Um, I just think voting is a rite of passage. It's a thing to do as part of your civic duty. And there's just something special about voting in person. Uh, but if you choose to vote by mail like the president does, like our troops do when they're overseas, it's going to be fine. And Bishop Benjamin, a, a similar question. Uh, under what circumstances should we allow mail-in voting? And Again, should people I, feel I, safe? Yeah, I was in, I was in the military. I, I remember sending my vote in. I was overseas. And of course, you, you, you can't, if you can't be in person, 
uh, then you, then you you have to mail it, mail it in. Um, we we have uh, some that are just not going to be uh, in uh, the current place where they are. They need to do early voting. Um, absentee voting has been around. It it, it works. Um, I believe that again. We need to make sure every person do not think that your vote is not going to count. It's going to count. And uh, my prayer, too, is that we will have the integrity at the polls where we see where we see that people are actually being counted. Um, I had a person that said he went to the polls and said they told him he already voted. <laughs> and so we just need to make sure that we have integrity at the polls. Sticking with you, Bishop. Uh, how we're, we're in a national conversation now about race following the tragic deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. How do you define system, systemic racism? Do you believe it exists? And if so, what can Congress do to counteract it? I, be, I believe, in, uh, and in being an African American, I believe racism exists. I believe our history proved that it, it exists, but I also believe that we have overcome uh, many many obstacles um, from our past. Uh, there have been opportunities, we can see it. I I'm surprised that the, that the uh, Democrats are not uh, praising God for the first black president. Um, how can America be a racist when you have a black president? Why, why are they not celebrating that trophy? Um, they, they, they just throwing that aside uh, to make it seem like we haven't advanced. Yes, there may be some uh, individuals and groups who still don't get it, but at the same time, our nation has overcome so many. We, we, we have people who have, uh, again, Secretary Ben Carson, my goodness, the advancements um, in medicine uh, through him. I, I think we really need to make sure that we are not trying to topple over our successes while we're trying to point out something that's already been solved uh, and we just need to keep on working at it we are a young nation and but we need to keep growing um, but not take us back and make us into a violent and angry culture where people don't even feel safe to talk about uh, certain issues without feeling rejected congressman to recap we are uh, how do you define systemic racism do you believe it exists and if so what can congress do to counteract it what Congress can do is to set the table for uh, this, for systematic racism to be solved. And systematic racism is just as the word suggests, it is a system of things, I hate using a word to define a word, but it is a system or a methodology um, that's in place that continues to perpetuate a certain ideal. And this particular ideal is racism. Um, Congress can set the table by doing certain things passing laws that would prevent certain types of actions, like the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act, which would ban no-knock warrants, which would ban chokeholds, but also which would require uh, tra certain training methodology, methodologies to be put in place so that people realize their biases. You know, you have a bias, Craig, I have a bias, we all have biases, but people with guns and badges and who have the ability to enforce laws we need to make sure that they understand what their biases are so they can recognize them as they uh, walk into certain encounters. Um, you know, but ultimately, uh, so that's what Congress can do. You know, like, uh, like the bishop, I, I too am an ordained Baptist minister. I understand that it's prayer and faith that's ultimately going to solve this problem. Um, but while we're praying on it and while we're believing in it, we have to be about the business of working on it and that involves certain changes in society to set the table. And it also requires us as elected officials to reject certain things and not to say that there are good people on both sides when folks are carrying torches and yelling out anti-Semitic slogans. Thank you, Congressman. You've uh, mentioned the Justice and Policing Act uh, a couple of times now, so I'm gonna ask the question to uh, Bishop Benjamin. Um, this, this act has now passed the House of Representatives, but stalled in the Senate. Uh, as the Congressman mentioned, the Comprehensive Police Reform Bill would prohibit uh, law enforcement from using racial profiling, ban no-knock warrants, and mandate the use of de-escalation techniques and require 
that deadly force be used only as a last, result, uh, last resort. Do you support this bill? And if not, are there other police reforms that you would support? For the, and this I sh goes to you, Bishop, Bishop Benjamin. It's for me. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I wanted to say something about th there are some problems with the HEROES Act. There, there were some things that were thrown into that bill, uh, massive price tag for other, I guess, pet peeve projects uh, for the Democratic Party, uh, such as about $25 million or so for arts and humanities and things like student loan forgiveness, um, environmental justice grants. Uh, my, my opponent uh, tweets all day about climate change. How, how many people in the 4th Congressional District are going to bed at night worrying about the climate? Uh, they're worrying about what's going on in the streets. Uh, am I safe? Can I go back to work? Can I open up my restaurant? Uh, can, I mean, can my children get back to school? They're falling asleep at the laptop. Virtual learning is now just virtual dancing. Uh, there's, there's this, th these are the things that are really, really important. And, and being able to surround our police with the right support, not defund them. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard about reimagining of uh, the police. When, when I call 911, I, I don't need a psychiatrist. I want a police officer to come to my aid and to let them to defuse the situation, whatever that might be. Yes, get more training. Yes, get more what I call wraparound services. Yeah, and, and please, let's get more officers on the street. Um, like Richmond right now, you're talking about one officer for every 380 citizens. That is not acceptable. We need more police on the streets, not less. And Congressman, we know you support the Justice and Policing Act, but uh, we'll let you respond now and explain why it's necessary. Well, you know, he, he, he talks about the HEROES Act and he talks about uh, uh, understanding racism. Um, but if he understood racism, do you understand that the investments that are called for for environmental justice go to those communities that happen to be black, that happen to be brown, that happen to be tribal, who suffered from environmental racism because of redlining. You remember redlining, Bishop, when black folks were forced to live in certain areas and, and that continues today. Not that they're forced to, but that trend of living in certain areas continues, continues today. And those are the areas where all the pollution was put. Those were the areas where bad businesses were put in place that polluted our water, polluted our air. And so investing in those communities is a good thing. It is not some sort of pet project of the Democratic Party. It ought to be the pet project of the United States of America, quite frankly. The reason why this police reform bill is so important is to restore people's confidence in the system. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have an encounter with the police and not survive to get to court. You shouldn't have an encounter with the police and end up saying, I can't breathe, and have someone's knee on your neck for eight minutes and 43 seconds. That should never happen. You shouldn't be in your own home, have someone knock on the door, it be the wrong place, and, have, and find yourself waking up, as the, as the old folks said, waking up dead because someone ex executed a no-knock warrant and didn't know what they were doing. Most police officers are good officers, but for the bad ones, we need to put in place these rules, these reforms, they're necessary, and that's the reason people are out in the streets. You talk about law and order, you talk about safety, yet you don't want to address the reason why people are out in the streets. You want to cast aspersions at any number of things, but I still have yet to hear answers. It's easy to throw stones. Where are your answers? Congressman Rukichin, staying with you, in 2018, the New York Times ranked U.S. cities with highest eviction rates. Five of the top 10 cities are in Virginia, and two of those are in the 4th Congressional District, Richmond and Chesapeake. What can be done at the federal level to ensure that more Virginians and Americans have access to safe and affordable housing? You know, the, on top of that tragedy, one of the tr really tragic things is, is that the dollar amount for the eviction process is relatively small. You know, what is actually owed in the grand scheme of things is relatively small. So we've already started the process with our COVID relief acts, um, whether it's CARES 1, CARES 2, or the HEROES Act, in terms of providing relief for those folks who are suffering from the possibility of evictions. Uh, we've put that in place. I want to continue that even post-COVID, um, but we need to make sure that we handle both sides of the equation. One of the challenges to the president's executive order was it didn't help any, do anything for landlords. 
we've got to take care of the landlords too because they have bills as well. The reality is this, you know, we tend to think of uh, landlords as these big conglomerates, you know, they're just rolling in money, like, you know, Mr. Monopoly with the cigar and all that. In some cases, that's the case, but I'm concerned about the retired couple that saved all those years and want to supplement their social security with some rental income and now here this comes and, you, and you're talking about not paying them. We've got to make sure that yes, I don't want to put a soul in the street not doing a COVID, COVID season, but I also want to make sure that those people who are providing them shelter get paid and that means the federal government is going to have to dip in their pocket and make sure that those folks are, give, get some relief as well. Thank you, Congressman. Bishop Benjamin, what can Congress do to ensure that more Virginians and Americans have access to safe and affordable housing? I, I think the key is, is, is always education. Uh, ed educated people are an armed people and, and, and they're forewarned people as well. They, they, they know what to do, where to go, where the resources are. One of the things I loved about uh, what I've been doing lately working uh, with this administration is being able to show people where the resources are. As a congressman, I believe you should be accessible uh, because making bills and policy is one thing, but being able to call your congressman and say, where do I deal with this situation, whether it be affordable housing, where do I get to education uh, to get a first time loan for first time home buyers? Where do I do this? And, and sometimes if you're not accessible, like my opponent is not, people have called his office and he has failed to even return their calls. And, and we have to understand ac access is one of the main reasons why people send us to, uh, to, to DC to have access. But if you're not accessible, if you're missing, then how can people have access to the resources, to the programs? Um, one of the things uh, about the excitement of showing a family how to buy their first home, I, I think that's a powerful program that we could doing in Congress, showing people how to apply for even grants. Grants are not just for the big businesses and big time industries. Uh, individuals can come together, communities. Uh, we've been working with the Opportunity Zones, showing people how to come together to form public-private partnerships, to merge with profits and nonprofit organizations. Uh, that's what Congress should be doing. Thank you. Uh, Bishop, staying with you, news broke today that the same extremist militia group that had allegedly plotted to kidnap Michigan Governor Gresham Whitmer also discussed kidnapping Governor Ralph Northam. Are there there are also concerns that militia groups may commit, act, commit acts of violence if President Trump is defeated and does not accept the results. How do we lower the political temperature in both Congress and among the public at large to prevent chaos like this from erupting? I think, I mean, first and foremost, as a people, as Americans, it's time for us to come together and, and, and finally realize that uh, we are one people. Uh, the volatileness and the, the, and the, the anger and the animosity, uh, Republican, Democrat, all of that that's going on right now, there is, a, there is an enemy that wants us to be divided. There's an enemy that wants us to pit ourselves against one another. There's an enemy that wants us not to trust uh, the, the systems uh, that we have in place and, and to be able to work to make them better. There is an enemy, and I, and I believe that if, if if, if those individuals, like for the governor uh, in Michigan, uh, they, they should be uh, caught and, and charged uh, to the utmost uh, charges of the law, whatever it is, and, and then any other thing like that, because nobody deserves to be harassed, whoever they are. Nobody deserves to be hounded upon, um, and, and that's just not the American uh, way. We have to begin to understand that this is the greatest nation of all time. And there are some who would want to bring us down to the, to the lowest degree, to get us fighting one another, hating one another, pitting against one another, and that's not what really makes us great Americans. Yes, we have disagreements. Yes, we have debates like this here today. Uh, but that's when we say, I agree to disagree, but not to the point where you want to harm someone and even take someone's life. That's not America. Congressman McEachin, how do we take down the political temperature in this country? I think we do that by when we're engaged in the public square by telling the truth. Uh, telling the truth in a respectful way, not in an accusatory way. Uh, for instance, uh, my opponent just accused me of 
not listening, not being responsive to my constituents, yet he'd have a hard time explaining how we've recovered over $2 million for our constituents in, in, this, uh, in, in this Congress already, and it, the Congress isn't over yet. Uh, you don't do that by being missing. You do that by being active and listening to your constituents and reacting to uh, their desires. The other thing is, is that leaders have to understand that words matter. Nicknames don't help anything. Missing Mac Eachin, like he likes to run around saying, like that's, like, like that's helping the situation. Or like the president does, right? The president likes to um, make up nicknames for people or say, liberate Virginia, liberate Michigan, and then wonders why these things happen. Words matter, actions matter, how you conduct yourself in the public square matters. We need to conduct ourselves as Americans. We need to conduct ourselves as if we're trying to move towards that more perfect union. And we need to conduct ourselves not as we're learning that this is the greatest country in the world, like we already know that this is the greatest country in the world. Thank you, Congressman. We've just got time for a few more questions. Uh, the next question is to you. If Joe Biden is elected, the country will likely go in a very different direction in regards to immigration. What would you like to see in a comprehensive U.S. immigration policy? I'd like to see a path uh, for those who are here to become full U.S. citizens. Um, you know, a lot of them have been here, a lot of them have been paying their taxes, and obeying the laws. Uh, those folks need a path to citizenship. Uh, we also need to make sure that we're being fair as we let immigrants in from all across the globe. Uh, we don't want to just favor, you know, <laughs> we want to do the opposite of what Donald Trump has been doing. He wants to favor only certain uh, Scandinavian countries and he doesn't want to care about countries in Africa or countries in Central America or countries in Asia. He has a word for those that I can't repeat on, on this television station. We want to make sure that we're doing exactly as the Bible instructs us to do, to be welcoming to the alien because we were once slaves in Egypt. And so we want to make sure that we're doing that as part of our public policy. That doesn't mean tearing down borders. That doesn't mean being secure, but it does mean being welcoming and opening to those who want to live the American dream. Thank you, Congressman. Bishop Benjamin, what direction would you like to see the country go on immigration? Uh, well, I'm for uh, immigration, just legal uh, immigration. Uh, uh, the building of, of the, the border walls has, has stopped so many things, not, not just illegal immigration, but drugs crossing into our borders, gangs, MS-13, all those things. Um, this, the safety of our nation, America first. I, I believe that when we take care of America first, then the pathway to citizenship is, 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 is the next step. We should be able, and, and, and let me just say something about missing McEachin. I'm not just saying that just to be saying that. His voting record shows he's been missing. If, if we had to give a, a grade for his voting record in Congress, it's been like a, a C minus. He's not been there. He's not been there to vote. So I'm, I'm not just saying he's missing just to have a cliche. He's actually been missing. He hasn't been there. Um, and he's not been there for his people. I, I think the, the whole thing about what, what we're dealing with immigration right now, uh, it's, yes, it, it looks like it's a big mess, but there are solutions. Matter of fact, our president actually came with a, a deal to, to provide a pathway for DACA, and Congress, Congress didn't want the deal because uh, they just didn't want to give the president credit for solving the uh, immigration problem. And my opponent was there. He was there, had a chance to have a pathway for the dreamers, and they didn't want it when the time it was offered. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, do you think the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has current laws on firearms need to be altered? And if so, which ones? This is for you, Bishop. This is for me? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think it's a great question. The, the, the whole issue uh, behind what's going on now with our Second Amendment, uh, we, we see right now where our uh, liberties and our uh, freedoms are slowly but surely being eroded. Uh, this, this is something where our Constitution provides for the right to bear arms. Uh, to make it seem that everyone is a criminal uh, and to throw everyone in the basket to say that we now need to ban uh, guns and take guns away. We're seeing right now police officers are being taken, uh, are being said they're being taken out of the schools. So the, the safety of our children, 
Uh, this is something where we need to make sure that we are making sensible laws to get guns away from the mentally disordered, uh, th those that can hurt themselves and harm others, but to actually just, just make up bans just to take the guns away from law-abiding citizens is not the right way to go. Um, our founding fathers put in place, in place, uh, the Second Amendment, and I thank God for all of Virginia that sent a clear message on January 15th on Rally Day uh, we call it 2A Day, it was actually also Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday holiday, that Virginia is a green state, a sanctuary, not uh, a sanctuary for uh, uh, illegals, but a sanctuary for those who want to protect people. We want to protect those who want to keep their Second Amendment rights. Congressman, now to you. What changes would you like to see in gun policy? Um, some of which we've been able to do in the House, but again, it, does, it has not passed the Senate. I'd like to see the Charleston loophole close. Of course, you know, the gentleman who, uh, uh, if I can use that term loosely, who went into the church in Charleston and, sh and shot those folks who were engaged in Bible study, had gotten a gun um, and he shouldn't have had one. And the reason he got it was is that the background check didn't come back and he was able to get into that loophole between the time he applied for the uh, gun in between the time the uh, uh, system said he shouldn't have it, he was able to secure the gun. I'd like to see universal background checks to ensure that uh, we know that the gun is being transferred and being transferred appropriately to someone who is uh, eligible to have a gun, which is all Americans unless you have some sort of exception. We, we want to make sure you don't have that exception as we go through our universal background checks. We want to make sure that those who are not capable of handling a gun, those who might be mentally infirm, whether it's a permanent mental infirmness, disability, or whether it's a temporary one, uh, don't have access to guns. Um, so those are the changes that we need to make. It's all about sensible gun safety. No one wants to ban guns or take guns away from folks. It's safety first. Thank you, Congressman. Now, we are almost out of time. I'm going to ask an abbreviated question for our final question, um, which is, do you, first, and first to you, uh, Bishop Bishop Benjamin, do you support m raising the minimum wage, and if so, by how much? I believe, and, and, and being a small business person, I believe that the minimum wage was put in place. The idea was to take steps. What I've learned being a business person is that you give person, a person the opportunity to show that they've learned certain things at a certain level and then they're ready to go to the next level. I've seen certain places where they've increased the minimum wage but then they had to now uh, let go people because they can't afford to keep everybody on because of overhead. I believe the minimum wage, if it, if it can work to increase without destroying the employer's ability or capacity to maintain the business, then go for it. There's some organizations like Amazon and And, 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 and we're, we're, we're asking for shorter answers here. So what do you think is the appropriate dollar amount? Let me, in a sentence or two. Uh, well, I, I don't think there's an appropriate dollar. I think that's up to the employer what that okay. appropriate dollar amount Thank should you. be. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Congressman Mukichin, same question. Should the minimum wage go up? And if so, by how much? Uh, it depends on where you live as, as to the dollar amount. So I'm going to use the term living wage. It absolutely should go up. I was a small businessman. I had a law firm at each and NG. I understand what it means to make a payroll, to pay uh, payroll taxes, to hire people, to have to unfortunately fire people as well. Um, but the reality is, is where there's a will, there's a way, and you need to invest in your people. So yes, folks ought to be able to make a living wage, and that number depends on where you live. All right, thank you, Congressman. And believe it or not, we are out of time. The first closing statement goes to you. Uh, it has again been the honor of my life to represent the folks of the 4th Congressional District. I appreciate the honor and I ask for your vote. Uh, one thing the Bishop said was absolutely right. You've seen a stark difference tonight. I have answers. All you heard was accusations from the other side. You didn't hear a health care plan. You didn't hear whether someone w was willing to go to Congress and mandate an increase in the, in the minimum wage. You didn't hear about well, how, how do we exactly tackle systematic racism? What do we do about police reform? Do we do police reform? Uh, is there more to police reform than just standing with the police, which we all do, because we all stand with good police officers, but how do we handle the bad ones? You didn't hear those answers tonight. You're not gonna hear those answers. What you did hear was someone acting just like the president 
interrupting when it's not their turn to speak. You heard someone making up nicknames. You heard someone just making up accusations about people's positions out of whole cloth. I'm sorry that that's the way it went tonight, but you do have a contrast. Someone who really doesn't know what they're talking about as versus someone who's been there and who's delivered for you all these years. I ask for another term. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Congressman. Bishop Benjamin, your closing statement. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And again, I, I, can't, I can't say it with all sincerity that this is a crucial, a very crucial election for the fourth for Virginia. Uh, under the leadership uh, of uh, Congressman McKeachin, he's had opportunity to solve problems and he hasn't solved them. Uh, he hasn't helped with law and order. He hasn't helped with opening up our small businesses and getting our children back to school with the money follows the child. He hasn't helped with standing uh, with, again, our African Americans, those who have been unrested because of the death of George Floyd. He hasn't helped to calm them down. As a matter of fact, he's caused more riots and more looting um, in our cities. Uh, he hasn't set support for the police. There's so many things he hasn't done, but I believe it's time for new leadership. I believe I have the experience. I believe I have the discipline. I believe I have the calmness. Uh, sometimes you do have to stand up and fight. You can't be a rug for somebody just to roll over and run over. I learned that in the military. When it's time to fight, it's time to fight. And I believe it's time to fight for Virginia. For that new leadership, it has to take someone who's able to stand up and speak what they mean and mean what they say. At the same time, there's a level of compassion for those who cannot help themselves. I've seen the people in the community saying that we are afraid and we are scared and we want to move out of this area. And it needs a person who is there on the ground, who understands the heartbeat of their region and their district. And I believe that that person is me. Please go to my website, benjaminforcongress.com. Join my team and I, I, I ask for your vote. And I hope I earned your vote tonight. I believe I did. So God bless you and God bless the 4th Congressional District and God bless America. Thank you, Bishop. With that, we are out of time. This has been Virginia Decides, a 4th Congressional District Forum brought to you by VPM News and Chamber RVA. Thanks to our candidates, Congressman Don McEachin and Bishop Leon Benjamin, and thank you to our audience at home. Please stay safe. I'm Craig Carper. Good night.